Welcome to Horror in Detail. Are you ready to embark on a chilling journey into the realms of darkness, the mysterious, and the bone-chilling world of horror stories? On this channel, we are dedicated to unraveling the most terrifying tales that will send shivers down your spine. First story they never ended the Montauk Project. I'm sure almost all of you have heard about the Montauk Project. If not here's a briefer, formed way back in the 80s, the project is was a black operation entirely focused on developing and implementing psychological combat techniques as well as other exotic experimentation. Think time travel, telekinesis, psychic abilities, cloning, paranormal and supernatural events, cryptids, immortality, alien life, non-human technology, dimensional portals, the works. Some say that the project is the successor of the Philadelphia experiment and they're not wrong. The crazier the phenomena, the more likely it is was to be studied. Initially the project only took place at Camp Hero, but eventually it was split into multiple branches and the main facility moved about 18 miles to the northwest of Montauk Point, on Plum Island. Officially, the project is said to have never existed at all and unofficially it's said to have ended, but neither are true. How do I know that? Because I worked there until just days ago. Now, there's a lot I can say about what I think, or thought, the project was and there's a lot I can tell you about the things I saw, but I don't have much time and I guess that's the best place to start. I was stationed at the main facility on, well, actually underneath, Plum Island. At this facility the one thing they were most eager to master was time. And there's a reason for this. A long time ago, or so it's told, there was a not-so-tiny accident at the facility over at Camp Hero. It involved one of the original overseers of the Montauk project who oversaw the study of time. He had created an experiment that utilized reverse-engineered found technology. The technology ended up working, but not in a way they had previously calculated and the results were problematic. What happened to the overseer and his team changed the way the entirety of the project operated. Restrictions were implemented, and the experiment separated. And yet, despite this, the project was still not shut down. Instead, it was decided that the technology would simply be moved to a more secure location and thus the new main facility at Plum Island was born. I've heard many things about the technology used in the accident. That is was recovered from Roswell, or found it in the ocean, or melted it out of ancient polar ice. I've heard it looks like a portal, or a doorway, or a gate. One person told me it's basically one big rock with a human-sized hole in the center of it. Not spectacular by any means, but certainly mysterious and the source of much speculation. Ever since the day of the accident, this gate has been contained under 24-hour surveillance deep, deep below the island and, if you ask me, it's almost like they're scared something will come out of it, rather than that someone will go in. I don't blame them. Because last night, while I was mopping up some vomit and piss and blood, while nearly everyone else in the facility was engaged with another, highly volatile experiment, there was a massive containment failure. Or, to be euphemistic, an accident. And it involved the gate. Surprise. Let me back up. I said I work, worked, at the main facility, and that part is true, but as for me witnessing, and I mean really witnessing, strange shit, well, that's a whole other bag of worms. Why? because I was part of the cleanup crew, a glorified janitor. I know, I know. How could you possibly rely on the word of a peon like me, a lowly, unimportant, easily replaceable cog in the wheel? Because I didn't sign up to be a janitor. I'm part of the US Chemical Corps. I was initially brought on for containment purposes, to stand guard over the, things they keep, kept there. But soon discovered that my duties were more akin to that of a janitor than anything else, I would spend hours a day cleaning up after these experiments, only ever seeing the aftermath of them. It wasn't pretty, or fun, or respectable, but at the end of the day it pulled in decent pay. And also, you shouldn't judge people based on their job, just saying. Well, as a glorified, slightly resentful janitor, I took it upon myself to find out as much as I could about this incredibly secretive place I cleaned. I hid my curiosity under a guise of extreme dullness and dimness. No one suspected I was capable of anything other than wiping shit and blood and vomit off floors and out of cages and chambers and observation tombs, so I played that to my advantage. As my grandmother used to say, when life give you lemons, 
cut them in half and squeeze them into the eyes of those who gave them to you. And last night, I was working in full gear down in sub-basement 3, the place they keep the immortals. I was cleaning a particularly bad case. Guess the immortal in question was going slowly insane. It had gnawed at both wrists until it burst the veins and had to be euthanized. There was blood everywhere. And it stank. Unfortunately, I happened to be the only janitor on call that night, so it was just me and an escort of two guards. We were all wearing biohazard gear, but theirs were black, mine was white. I was inside the containment chamber, in one of the darkened corners, hidden behind the hefty observation tomb, while the two men stood outside shooting the shit. I didn't recognize their voices, so I wondered for a moment if they were new. They wouldn't last long, no one ever did here. But their shit was certainly interesting to listen to. Suddenly they stopped talking, and their voices became serious, professional. Didn't expect you here this late, hmm. I peeked out from around the side of the tomb. It was the project lead, who I'll refer to as PL from now on. Her clothes were mudded, and her hair was wet. And she was wearing a red coat and these old-looking cowboy boots. PL never wore anything other than professional attire or her hazard gear. Behind her, following silently, head hung low, was some random girl I'd never seen before. She was wearing black leggings and a chunky sweater. Around her neck was a thick metal collar. It was blinking a blood-red light. I wondered for a moment if she was PL's daughter, then banished the thought from my mind before it got away from me. PL murmured something that I couldn't hear and both guards laughed uncomfortably. One of them made to gesture back with a thumb at me, probably about to tell PL why they were down there, but before he could make the full movement PL pulled out a pistol and shot both him and the man standing next to him in the head. Boom, boom. Quick as a flash. They slumped backwards before falling unceremoniously to the ground. I covered my mouth before I could make a sound, trying to make myself as small as possible against the corner and behind the tomb. The girl following PL didn't even flinch. I wondered if she was doped up. Maybe the collar was doing something, I don't know. PL kicked one of the guards in the foot like she was checking to see if he was dead. Satisfied, she murmured something and turned to leave. The girl looked up in my direction, then looked down again and followed PL to the door. I'm not sure if she saw me, but I didn't move for what felt like hours after they disappeared, my heart pounding in my throat. Neither of the guards moved again. Finally, I decided PL had left and that I had to get Myas out of there. I crept out of the chamber and into the hallway. There were several more unmoving bodies littering the floor. I chanced a glance back over my shoulder and I saw it an open door. It was the door that led down to the containment chamber the gate was in. I hesitated, wondering why it was open before realizing PL must have opened it. And, despite my fear, despite my doubt, despite the death around me, I was curious. So curious. I wanted to know what this was about, I wanted to know why PL had killed in cold blood, if it was worth it, I wanted to know a lot of things, but most of all, I wanted to see the gate. I wanted to see if it was real, if it could do the things they said it could do. So, I stepped through the open door and into a darkened room. The door swung shut behind me with a resounding boom. Before I could fully panic, my eyes adjusted to the darkness and I saw a red button projected onto what looked like a wall made of obsidian. Carved near the top of the wall was an insignia, a lion wearing a crown and a unicorn wearing a bejeweled necklace holding up a shield split into quarters. Above the shield was an open eye with an iris in the shape of a many-pointed star. I stared at the carving for a moment before walking forward and pressing the projected button tentatively. My heart pounded multiple times a second as I waited. Silently, a thin beam of light appeared down the wall and two doors slid open. It was an elevator. This time I didn't even hesitate. I stepped right in and watched the doors closed with a hiss. A cool female voice rang out around me. Access to containment chamber null has been unrestricted and decontamination deprogrammed. Would you like to proceed? I stammered out an affirmative. Acknowledged. Now leaving sub-basement 3. That elevator ride felt like both a million years and less than a second, and sooner or later I was looking out into a short corridor that led out to a cavernous space. Its size left me disoriented and apprehensive. It was definitely the chamber that held the found technology. 
A low light lit the area and I blinked once, letting my eyes adjust. And then I saw it. It was, is real. The gate. It stood there, hulking and ominous, in the middle of the cavern, raised about a foot in the air on a dais made from bedrock. Carved around the entirety of the human-sized hole was a strange script I couldn't quite make out. The hole itself allowed none of the dim light through, it was pitch black and visceral, like something was hiding inside it, just beyond its edges. P.L. was standing next to it, reaching up. And it was so surreal seeing her there, calm as a cucumber. She looked so normal. And I was so entranced by the gate I didn't even think to hide. P.L. looked over at me and it was in that moment I realized something was wrong. Very, very wrong. Her eyes, normally a light sea green, were fully black. No green. No white. Full black. And she didn't look surprised or scared or satisfied to see me standing there, gaping at her. She looked eager. The girl didn't look up at all. Why, hello there, she said, lowering her arm. Do you know what assimilation means? I didn't respond, and she continued. How long have you been watching all of us? All of you? She laughed. I'm never alone now. What does that mean? They got you bugged. Who's the girl? Another laugh. You're smart for a janitor. Cleaning up shit is how I make money, it's not who I am. What's going on? Is this standard protocol? Too smart, she corrected. I'm glad you followed me. Glad. It might need to. She looked back at the gate. P.L., mm, what the hell are you talking about? What the hell is going on? P.L. laughed and then her voice changed. It sounded both high and low, like multiple people were speaking at the same time. I'm going to let them in. It was my turn to laugh. It was all just so absurd. All this secret, shadowy shit. All the tests, all the deaths, everything. Finally, I said, I don't know what you mean by that, but this is absolutely Bat's hit. Instead of responding, P.L. reached out towards the gate, hovering her hand just above the side of it like it was some long-lost lover. I was about to ask her what the hell was going on again, when she reached behind her back, pulled out her pistol, and shot me in the shoulder. I yelled and sank low, trying not to panic, trying to stymie the blood flow as fast as possible. P.L. snickered and grabbed the girl who was just standing there, silent and docile. She tugged the girl forward, towards the human-sized hole. Suddenly, there was yelling and three guards in all black tactical biohazard gear ran past me from the corridor the elevator was in. All three were armed to the teeth. Two of them had their weapons trained on PL and one of them had what looked like a sword strapped to his back. I immediately praised the powers that be for their arrival. Took them long enough, I remember thinking. P.L. glanced at them and made what can only be described as a noise of extreme frustration. It sounded like multiple people groaning at once. She turned towards the gate and shoved the girl with all her strength at the gaping black hole in the center. And in that moment, I swear time froze and all five of us watched the girl and her trajectory. It looked like she was going to go straight through that human-sized hole, when she suddenly tripped and smashed head first into the side of it, falling backwards onto the dais. The collar around her neck still blinked that blood-red light. She didn't get up again. One of the guards roared and ran forward. It was the one with the sword. He was holding it double-fisted, left hand above his right on the hilt. He scrambled onto the dais and without missing a goddamn beat he swung it link-style, around in a full circle like it was slightly too heavy for him and cut P.L. clean in half. It was insane. There was a moment of silence that lasted both no time at all and eternity. And then, as we watched, P.L., well, there's no other way to say this, she melted. All the way from her head down to her boots. Her skin bubbled up and burnt off, her blood evaporated, her bones blew away to dust. And what was left of her pulled down into two puddles of this thick black undulating gelatinous substance that instantly began to recombine into something horrific. A monster. A huge, horrific blackened blob that roiled and rolled on too many arms and legs and faces. There were parts of people, fucking people, inside of it, pushing out of it. They all looked like they were in the deep throes of passion or pain. And they were all moaning. It was high-pitched and low and terrible. I recognized one of the faces. It was P.L. She was laughing or crying or maybe both. 
scared me so much that I didn't realize I was screaming until I tripped backwards and nearly bit off the tip of my tongue. The monster made to move, but the guard swung at it again, cutting off multiple limbs and two faces in the process. Before he could get another swing out, it skittered with terrifying speed towards, then through the gate, instantly disappearing into the darkness at the same time an ear-splitting siren sounded. The script carved around the human-sized hole began to glow this brilliant purple-blue color and the ground beneath us all started to shiver and shake. The bedrock dais crumbled, sending the gate listing dangerously towards the corridor the elevator was in. A stone fell from above, then another, and another. I screamed again, sending a gush of blood down my chin. A bubble of blackness had formed around the human-shaped hole and burst, sending bits of black goo cascading down around us and revealing what I can only describe as a giant eye. It was bright blue. The pupil dilated and locked onto us. One of the guards pumped all six at it with what looked like a Mossberg 500. And they weren't normal slugs. They were way too bright and way too loud. The sound of them echoed over the siren and I blinked, blinded by the sudden exposure. The eye blinked too, totally unscathed. It had turned bright red. The guard with the Mossberg turned to the other two and yelled something. And, despite their masks, despite the siren and the stones and the giant eye, I could vaguely make out what they were saying. It sounded like they were arguing about whether or not to destroy the gate. One of them said they had to, the other one said it was too late, and the third asked to get the fuck out of there, then pointed over to the girl. The guard with the sword looked down at her, then handed it over to one of the other guards. He bent down and picked her up, not princess style, but over his shoulder like a soldier or sack of potatoes. And I know he was wearing a mask, but I swear he was crying as he carried her past. The guard now holding the sword slung the Mossberg onto his back and swiftly followed. The last guard, though, stopped and made his way towards me, ignoring the sirens, ignoring that thing staring straight at us. He bent low to my head so that I could hear him over the sound of the siren. You okay, mate? He had a slight British accent. I looked up at him. I could barely make out the color of his eyes from behind the mask, mudded green. I tried opening my mouth, but a spout of blood poured out, so I shook my head instead. He nodded then he helped me up and back over to the room where the elevator was. The two other guards were waiting inside. What are we gonna do with him? The guard now holding the sword nodded in my direction. Nothing, the one who helped me up replied. He was still bracing me, making sure I didn't fall. But I'm not leaving him down there. What about that rock? What about that thing? Why didn't you let me blow it to hell? The guard next to me sighed loud enough for me to hear it through his gas mask but didn't respond. I glanced up at him, then over at the two other guards. Obviously, I couldn't tell much about them through all that gear, but the one holding the girl seemed to still be crying. He hadn't said a single word since picking her up. The guard awkwardly holding the sword seemed skittish. The sword he was holding was bright silver and seemed to glow. The same strange script carved into the gate was engraved up the center of the blade. I couldn't read it. We arrived moments later at sub-basement 3, the cool female voice of the elevator warning us again about the lack of a decontamination process. I watched the guard who helped me place several blocks of C4 into the elevator and order it to go back down. We didn't wait to watch what happened. The basement was deserted, but the alarm was loud as ever. We made our way up and up and up until we reached the ground floor. It was utter chaos and the three guards, the girl, and I slipped into it unnoticed. The remaining staff in the facility were rushing to gather data and secure experiments and subjects for transportation. The British guard immediately handed me off to a scientist, telling her I was in dire need of medical attention and that the gate was compromised. He leaned over to me and said four words just loud enough so that I could hear. I turned to reply, but he, the two other guards, and the girl had already disappeared into the crowd. Never saw any of them again. The four words were, do what they say. In the hours that followed the containment failure, all staff, subjects, and experiments were taken to a secure location for decontamination and processing. Some of us were released, others were forced to stay for extra processing. I was one of the lucky ones, if you could call it that. Before I was released, I was forced against my will to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And that was their first mistake, 
letting me go. Because honestly, fuck it. Fuck them. Fuck everything. If they decide to liquidate me then so be it. If I accidentally die in my sleep, or overdose, or suffer a massive heart attack, or they somehow blackmail me into doing it myself, so be it. I'm not afraid of them. What I am afraid of is that thing. I'm afraid of what will happen to the world if this shadowy shit is allowed to continue. I don't want to do what they say. And that was their second mistake, trusting me. I guess this is just my way of warning you all. There are things out there, things we don't understand, things we can't explain, hiding in darkness, hidden by darkness. What we see in our everyday lives, what we know about, hear about, read about, barely scratches the surface of what's really happening in the world. Well, I guess I should say this world. Second story. Don't hide from cryptids in Alaska, they're worse here. I've lived in Alaska my entire life. I live in one of the more populated parts of the state. I won't fully disclose for my safety. Though, I've seen a lot of things, and I'm not even very old. I've seen damn near everything AK had to offer. Well, I thought I had anyway. Turns out, cryptids are a lot more, angry, up here. We have the classic Sasquatch, Otter People, Dogmen, Serpents, our own version of the Boogeyman, Wendigos, and even Skinwalkers believe it or not. I've had the displeasure of being hunted by two of these. Take a wild guess. It started when I was at my friend's house, us sitting at the ridge on the border of their property. Where we sat had a trail leading up, and a light pole. It was around eleven at night, but Alaska winters get dark. We were sat under the yellow light from the pole, when I heard a branch snap and snow crunch. I assumed it was a moose so I told my friend to keep their eye out. They nodded and we continued to talk. A few minutes later, the snow crunched again and I felt my heart freeze. Now I'm a pretty paranoid person, but this was well before it had really taken effect. I'm still unsure which of the two cryptids it was, but it had infrasound. Infrasound is something big cats and other predators use to activate a prey's fight or flight. Usually ending up in the prey freezing. According to whatever the predator was, I was its next meal. I grabbed my friend by the hood when I stood up and ran down the trail. Pulling them along with me, they groaned in protest and confusion until I told them something was wrong. We ended up going inside that night and I didn't get a wink of sleep. I was too afraid of what was waiting outside. Fast forward to a few months later, it was July, I was sat with my window open and writing on my computer. I was home alone as I often am, but that didn't bother me. As I typed on my laptop, I felt something strange. That intense feeling of being watched. I tried to ignore it, but it overtook my body. I looked out the window to the edge of my driveway, next to the pond, and there it stood. A pale grey, malnourished, disgusting-looking creature. Sunken in eyes, slightly protruding teeth, and on all fours nonetheless. Though, this creature had a human-like body, aside from the twisted appendages. I froze in my spot when it caught my eye. I shoved my computer away from me and got up to crank in my window. Once my window started moving, so did it. Inching closer to my home with lanky, broken-looking legs. I wound my window up enough, flipped the lock and pulled down my curtain. That was the first night I had ever spent cowering in my bathtub with a pocket knife and a blanket. I hadn't seen the creature again until later in the year, winter. I was taking the garbage down to the end of my driveway when I heard the inhuman growling. It sounded like a dog had smoked twenty packs a day and tried to growl at me. I wasn't taking any chances and sprinted up to my porch, slamming open my door and locking every lock. My mom looked mortified, as was I. This happened on a few separate occasions, but this wasn't even all of it. I would walk to the bus stop in the mornings, so obviously this could be an issue. One morning, my cat, Fergus, had followed me down to the bus stop. I was petting him as I stood next to a stop sign. Now, Fergus is the sweetest cat I have ever met. He didn't bat an eye at dogs, moose, other cats, nothing. He was a badass and a sweetheart in one cat. Imagine my surprise when he spun around, arched his back and started hissing and spluttering. I was horrified, this beefed-up Manekoon cat was hissing into the darkness at six in the morning. Thankfully, the bus had come to my aid and I got on immediately. 
Fergus passed away recently, so I'm a little nervous about not having that warning next time. Now these next few experiences all happened in the span of a week. It started with me, sitting in my living room watching some show, when I heard something on the porch. This was before I had a security system so I couldn't really see it. There's a small, obscure window at the top of my door, but I'm just shy of tall enough to see out it. So I had to go by sound. I slowly crept around my house, making sure each door and window was locked up. I hurried my dog into my parents' room and into the bathroom. He likes hiding in the shower so he didn't really mind. Though, when he started snarling, which he never does, I almost started sobbing. The layout of my parents' room is you walk in, there's their bed, two windows on either side of the bed, and the bathroom next to one of the windows. My mom put the spare mattress we had up in front of that window. I hadn't locked it. I frantically dialed up my mom's number and called her quietly, while hugging my dog. I was crying. She ended up coming home a few minutes later. When she went to get me out of her bathroom, there were scratch marks on the wall, something had tried to get in. This was when my paranoia spell started. I would frequently have episodes of pure irrational fear, usually ending in me sleeping in my bathroom. A few times, like this one, it was warranted. I was once again, sitting in my living room watching a show. When I heard something in the carport, the wall behind me was the one connecting to said carport. I got up, walked closer to the TV and turned it down, listening to each thudding step of the thing outside. I began to shake, and spiral into a panic attack. It slammed on one of the walls and I booked it to my bathroom. I locked myself inside with my knife, phone and charger. I wasn't prepared to hear it behind me, through the wall to my backyard. The only way to get in is hop the fence, unhinge the door or crawl over the mass of boxes blocking off the back porch. I didn't care which it had done, but I was mortified nonetheless. This thing had definitely known where I was in the house. Eventually, it stopped and must have left, so I left the cramped room to check on my dog. He was fine, though shaken. The last time I had seen it, had by far been the worst. I haven't had near as close of an experience since. I was on a Discord call with my friends, eating food and chilling in my kitchen. I was having a good time when I had the overwhelming feeling I was being watched. I knew exactly what it was, so I looked down to the bottom corner of my back door. My back door has a wide window encompassing pretty much the entirety of it, with a curtain that it came with. Peeking out from the sliver of room the curtain left, was sunken in eyes and grey skin. It was staring up at me. I grabbed my phone and ran to the bathroom for safety once more. After not hearing it for a while and having my friends calm me down, I went to my room. I knew the window was locked and closed, I felt a little bit safer there. Boy was I wrong. I had been halfway asleep when I heard ungodly scratching at my window. I was obviously confused and scared at the sound, when I peeled back my curtain, I was faced with that ungodly thing, with its fingers protruding through the window. I dropped the curtain and ran to my parents' room into the crawl space in their closet. Knowing this thing couldn't find me there, I had closed the door to the room itself and the closet on my way in. When I heard the mattress blocking my parents' window fall, careening onto their bed. With terrible scratching and snarling. I heard my dog going crazy outside the door. This disgusting thing was stalking around my parents' room looking for me. I heard each deliberate step, each gruff and breath of air. I was frozen on the ladder of the crawl space. I hadn't even turned the light on, which would be my saving grace. I heard the closet door whine as it was opened. This thing could open doors. It sniffed around my parents' clothes, I heard it step on the slab of wood keeping me hidden. I don't know how it didn't find me, maybe it was the smell of the carpet, but it eventually booked it and left. I stayed down there almost the entirety of the night until I heard my mom come home. That was the last time she left me home alone late at night, especially during winter. Third story. I went in search of a cryptid that my great-great-grandfather encountered. Whatever your thoughts on California as a state, there is no denying that it is the home to some of the most or inspiring landmarks not just in the US but in the world. Sequoia National Park, in particular, which is 631 square miles of beauty, is home to one of the world's oldest and largest living organisms in the world, the behemoth general Sherman redwood tree. 
It's mind-boggling to think that this ancient being was alive for thousands of years. It was alive during the American Revolution, during the Spanish Inquisition, it was alive during the reign of King Tut, as many of its sister redwoods were that constitute the forest lands. This lost world has seen its share of rivers moving and species evolving, and unfortunately, going extinct as well. The last known California grizzly bear sighting was in 1924 after they were thought to have been hunted to extinction by prospectors who poured into the California mountains during the gold rush. Who knows, there could still be one out there somewhere. These types of sightings happen quite frequently. The Yangtze River dolphin, thought to be extinct, had also recently reappeared. Beyond the California grizzly bear and the Cyclopean redwoods, I believe there is something else in those mountains. The radical California wildfires that have been plaguing the state for nearly two decades have had a monumental, possibly irreversible, toll on the various parks ecosystems. While most fires are natural and sometimes necessary, they have been getting more pervasive and out of control. Climate change is a big factor in their cause as rising temperatures begin to dry out kindling. However, there is another cause which is much less talked about. Over the years, people have been pushing more and more into the California wilds, not only creating infrastructure which gives fuel to fires, but carelessly causing them as well. Just some of the causes of the California wildfires range from vehicular sparks, faulty power lines, and a gender reveal. As a result, animal populations have begun to flee their homes and pushed back into towns and cities, occasionally resulting in attacks. The craziest stories of animal attacks weren't coming from those that wandered into town though. Soon after, there were circulations of attacks from strange unidentified creatures that were monstrous in nature. They were described as being nearly the size of a horse and bird-like. They sounded so outlandish. These people had to have been attacked by mountain lions or bears or something. The natives of the area however, actually had stories of these creatures dating back hundreds of years so possibly not too far-fetched. Either way, something that was once living deep in the woods was now beginning to emerge it seems. Then I came across something that cemented my intrigue. Not too long ago, my grandfather had passed away. I'd like to believe he went peacefully but the poor old man had a few health issues caused by the Central Valley's poor air quality. While rummaging through his old belongings, I came across, what my father told me, was the old journal of my great-great-grandfather, which my grandfather had kept in an old cedar chest. Apparently my great-great-grandfather was quite the renowned tracker and surveyor during his time. I spent a whole afternoon reading that thing, emerging myself into a time which sprang into existence right after the era of the American Old West. One of the journal entries details an expedition up into the Sequoia National Forests. July 26, 1908. The previous few nights have been filled with such peril as I have never felt in all of my previous adventures. We have come up into the Sierra Nevadas, my colleague and I, Mr. Jim Foxhart, for a very peculiar job sanctioned to us by the state of California. The state is beginning more aggressive expansion into these foothills, which were once occupied by Mona Chi. They claim this expansion has caused some commotion from some peculiar wildlife, sounding mostly as monsters in their various descriptions. We rendezvoused with a Dr. Edward McMillan, a biologist from the University of Davis, who has accompanied us to catalogue and identify this potentially unknown species though I was dubious that we would come across anything of the sort. On about the third night, setting camp much deeper into the redwood forest, I was only an hour or so into my night watch when I began to hear loud screeches, the likes of which were unidentifiable to me. These screeches would come and go at no predictable pattern but they seemed to be calling to each other and getting louder. Mr. Foxheart was also awakened by this sound and we sat there together for a good 15 to 20 minutes attempting to identify what creature it could belong to. Having no such luck, we woke Dr. McMillan, who also stated that these sounds were not of an animal in which he was familiar with. We were certain, however, that it was multiple animals, a pack of some sort, and that they were predatory. We grabbed our rifles and lanterns and headed towards the source of the nearest cries but the cries had stopped. I heard some rustling just to our right and upon raising my lantern, I was flabbergasted to see a large emu of some sort but with a large horse head, sharp claws on both hands and feet, and a long feathery tail. Its eyes glistened in my light, and though I only caught a quick glimpse of it, I could see that it was a beast almost the size of a horse. 
The animal quickly darted off with great speed. The other two men were just as puzzled as I am, though Dr. Macmillan had said what we had just seen looked very much like a species in the Dromaeosauridae family, a species of dinosaur. We tracked them down for about a mile, but the further we pushed away from camp, the more we began to hear loud screeches, to which Foxheart agreed, sounded very much like warning cries. Evidently, we were pushing into their territory deep into the forest. We lost track of the creatures and the calls subsided. We spent another couple of weeks in the forest but after that night, made no further contact or found any relevant traces and so decided that this pack must have moved deeper into the forest to avoid human conflict. I had never really been a big believer in cryptids like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. Sure, it was amusing watching those documentaries on the Discovery Channel or those videos on YouTube but I always felt that there were other explanations for what people encountered. This connection, however, was just too tantalizing there was no way it could be exactly as everyone described it. Where could it have been hiding all these years? Besides, it had been a while since I had just gotten away back to nature, not that I needed such an excuse. After an exhausting few months of work and school balance my brain was on autopilot. Once the parks opened back up, I had decided to plan a solo outing for myself. I packed up some gear, my Kodak camera, rations, my lucky knife and headed out west to the sequoias. I drove up the winding roads, past some devastation left by the fires of the summer. Businesses and homes were burnt down. Some were just being cleared, some were being rebuilt. I was good to see that society would carry on, though I had no doubt in my mind that there were lives ruined. Would we ever learn our lesson? It was good to get out of the car after a few hour drive and stretch once I found a good campsite. I was lucky to find a place secluded, probably because this was an area which was associated with the alleged attacks. I actually did go on evening hikes with my Kodak and a field recorder. I'm not sure what I expected really. I guess I let my imagination get the best of me. I only wanted to spend a good week. I don't like wasting my vacation leave willy-nilly. Then, it became real. It was Thursday night when I was awakened from my sleep by a loud screeching sound. It invaded my dreams first, and then pulled me out, looking up at the moonlit tent walls. I laid there quietly for I don't know how long, trying to decipher that sound. The journal entry then came to mind. Was this what my great-great-grandfather heard? I was both excited and terrified. I had to investigate. I grabbed my Kodak, flashlight and of course, my knife, and slowly crawled out of my tent. I found that I was not as good as my great-great-grandfather had been at determining directions, as the sound sounded like it was coming from all around the forest, echoing through the old pines and off the cliffs. It soon became apparent to me that, as my grandfather had also determined, there were multiple calls responding to each other. I don't know what oddly placed bravery came over me but I had the sudden courage to search into the dark forest for them. I quietly scanned the area for them, at first only circling my campsite. Luckily, I had a good sense of direction, so I knew I wouldn't get lost. I then got a good bearing on where the sound was emanating from, so I started strolling in that direction. I walked for a good ten minutes when the screeches suddenly began to bark louder and more frequently. I heard a rustle just off in the distance to my left. I quickly aimed my powerful light, and saw a black bear running off. It wasn't really the bears I was worried about though. As I always had a small can of bear spray on me, but what was he running from? For whatever asinine reason, maybe I was still a bit tired, I pressed on. Now, I'm not a tracker by any means. I wasn't even in Boy Scouts, but I could have sworn I saw odd bird-like tracks in the dirt or at least I thought I did. The hair stood on my neck as more and more, the events of the journal entry and the stories suddenly became more plausible. I couldn't be, could it? This whole time, I guess I just thought I was going to find some loudly mating birds and then have a good chuckle and go back to bed. There was more commotion going on around me. I would frantically whip my light in the direction but would see nothing. Maybe about an hour or so into my night stroll, I came across some odd structure. It looked like some kind of weaving of sticks and trash. I cautiously approached for a closer. Oh my god. It was a nest. There were eggs in there, odd-looking eggs. They looked the size or regular chicken eggs actually. I stood there dumbfounded for a moment. Then it hit me. Something literally hit me. 
I went stumbling back as something slammed into my side with immense force. I quickly scrambled to my feet and frantically looked around. There were clicking noises now coming from all around me. Then I saw it. It jumped out of the foliage with tremendous height and began to cackle at me, bowing low. It was trying to intimidate me. Some sort of bird-like animal with a long tail diagonally pointing up and a long snout and claws at the end of its feathered arms. I instantly drew the connection between these creatures and the creatures of the stories. I had just stumbled upon something that may have existed for millions of years, evolving in its own way, in near total isolation and uncategorized by humans. Funny enough however, I did note one notable difference, these creatures were not actually horse size, more like the size of a large dog. Some things are just exaggerated I guess. In either case, the one staring me down sent shivers coursing through my body. I was suddenly knocked down again. I pushed myself up with all my might. There was another one. The one in front of me was just a distraction. Now, there were three, all flanking me. I knew there had to be more. I also knew they were just defending their nest. I wasn't any less terrified. One to my right charged me. I got him with my bear spray just as he lunged. I got him square in the face as he began to flail. The others looked puzzled and squawked at each other. I quickly sprayed a line of spray, and backed away slowly. I continued fast walking backwards with my light on the nest until it was out of sight. I would continuously hear squawking from around me. These forest ninjas were monitoring my every move. I had my bear spray ready as I figured that would be a more effective defense than my knife. It wasn't nearly as sharp as what they were packing. Every once in a while, I would catch a glimpse of them, their eyes shining in my light, off in the distance, flanking me. If these animals really wanted to, they could have swarmed me. I think they were just being sure that I didn't pose a further threat to their nest. They weren't taking any chances, and neither should I. I began hiking towards my jeep, bypassing my campsite as it would have been foolish of me to try to sleep there tonight. After some time, as I approached the roadside clearing where I parked my jeep, the squawking and rustling had faded. I hauled myself into my jeep, exhausted from the running and the terror. I locked the doors, reclined my seat and laid there contemplating what I just experienced, wondering if it was real or just a dream brought on by too many nights watching creepy videos. I didn't notice myself drift off to sleep. The next morning I got up late, around eleven-ish, as you can imagine after having the rough night I had. I made the short hike to my campsite and found it undisturbed. I packed up my tent and the rest of my belongings and gear, but took one last look around the site. I didn't see anything that would provide indication of what happened last night. I normally don't drink coffee but I grabbed some at the nearest 7-Eleven as I figured I'd have a long drive home. I unpacked my stuff as usual as if nothing different had happened this time. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe it was a dream. Hell, I didn't even think to use my camera or my field recorder. Damn. As I was unpacking my backpack however, I noticed something was caught to the back strap. It was a feather. A large feather. Fourth story. I think I ate in a cryptid ipe. This happened a few nights ago, and I'm still shook as the kids say. My friends Tal, Casey, Emma, Emily, Joel and I wanted a midnight snack. Note not using real names here. It's pretty much a given, especially in this sitch, but I'm still putting a disclaimer. We needed food after studying for some CLC2 test that half the group was dreading other half was writing a six-page essay. Midnight snacks at breakfast places are the ultimate college mood or even just a teenage mood. My friends and I took two cars, because two out of the friend group can drive have cars and I'm sick of sitting on Emma's lap. I'm the shortest of the friend group I swear they'd shove me in the glove box if there was room. I drove my car, with my best friend Tal in shotgun. The other four piled in Case's car. The others left about fifteen minutes before us. As I drive, Tal is on their phone. They're non-binary. Hey, Casey said that the Ipe is weird, like, really weird. What do you mean? I ask, trying to not take my eyes off the road. They said it's just abnormally small. And Casey's never seen it before but she's lived here her whole life. Tal says. As I think about this, we drive down an access road alongside the highway. The GPS says we should be right on top of it, but I hadn't seen it yet. 
Where is this damn ipe anyways? I wonder aloud. The GPS says arrived as we pass an empty lot. Ahead we had two options, merge back onto the highway or turn onto a slightly sketch road. I chose the road like a dumbass. I was looking for a place to turn around, and I saw past some other restaurants in the parking lots. There, through the literal fog I saw it. The cryptid ipe. Oh, there it is. We must have just missed it. Tal's ever the sweet optimist. We find a place to park and the place looks deserted. The building is unnaturally skinny, narrower than your average waffle house, that's the best descriptor I could come up with, sorry. It honestly looked like it had glitched into our world or something. Tal and I peer through the windows and see two waitresses, just sitting around on their phones, and one cook working hard in the back. We walk in to see our friends sitting in the very back corner of the place. The lights are dim, and look as if they could flicker out at any moment. Tal and I squeeze into the booth next to our friends. I sit next to Casey, my ex-girlfriend. She's also one of my closest friends, but I haven't exactly slept with anyone else in the friend group. Tal sits across from me, and smiles. Their smile fades as they look around the eerily quiet type. Is this place really, off to you guys? Emma asks. She looks nervous. Yeah, I told you guys, it's weird. Casey grins, turning to our friend Joel, who we refer to as Joey, it's about as weird as Joey. She gasps in realization, it's a cryptid ipe. No need to call me out in my favorite eating establishment. Joey says, deadpan. An inside joke in our friend group that Joey is a cryptid. He's so strange. One night, he'll be out partying and getting lit until 5 a.m. Other weekends he calls it a night at 10 p.m. after a calm smoke on his balcony. He's a weird old soul most of the time, who we almost never see during the day. Elusive, weird, unexplainable a cryptid. The vibes of this place are just so unsettling. Emily said. She was right. Finally, a waitress came around to give our friends their food, but she completely ignored Tal and I. She looked past us, as if we didn't exist. Casey yelled. Ah, uh, mm. Our friends need to order. The other waitress approaches. She addresses the table. Here are your menus, but there's a slight difference tonight. There are no pancakes, crepes or sandwiches of any kind available. Sorry for the inconvenience. She sounded robotic when she said it. Also, what kind of ipe doesn't serve pancakes? International house of what? It wasn't just robotic, but angry, or even scared. There was something very off about it. And she was pretty. Like, unrealistically beautiful. As if someone photoshopped a model and dropped her in there. She, no offense to IPE employees everywhere, just seemed out of place there. We ordered our food, and asked for waters to drink. Once she left, the table exploded with more conspiracy. What kind of IPE doesn't serve pancakes? Casey exclaimed. We all shushed her. She tended to be loud. That's what you take from that interaction. Emily, her roommate, exclaims much more quietly. All of that just felt so, unnatural. I feel like this place is going to disappear as soon as we leave. Emma joked. Now, throughout the evening my anxiety had gotten extremely bad. When it's bad, I struggle to talk. I'm already mostly deaf, so I go from talking to signing. Casey becomes my default translator, because nobody else can understand ASL. I essentially said. This place has very creepy vibes. The lights flickered after I signed this. I took a drink of my water, and it tasted strange. It tasted so strange. Like trees and nature, but not quite. It was as if someone tried to mimic the taste of the earth, to make it artificial. My heartbeat began to speed up, and I began to shake intensely. Not good when you need your hands to speak. Beads of sweat broke on my forehead. Emily and Emma looked just as distressed as me, Tal looked confused, Joey appeared completely unaffected, and Casey only seemed concerned for me. Anyone else feel sick? Emma whispered, not like, from the food. Something else. I could see her shaking too. Casey placed an arm around me. Normally, I'd be perturbed. But not in that moment of distress. It was the only comforting and familiar thing in the whole weird place. Yeah, I don't feel so good. Emily said, using a napkin to wipe the sweat from her neck. 
Should we go, Yor? Tal asked nervously. I could tell the place was starting to affect them too. I realized how silent the restaurant was. The kitchen was less than fifty feet away, and yet I couldn't hear a thing. Not even the ringing that occasionally persists in my damaged ears. Being hearing impaired, I decided to ask those with better ears than I. Do any of you hear that? Wait, what did she say? Emily asks. Casey translates. I understand. It's completely silent in here. Tal realizes. It's fine guys. I don't know what you're talking about. Joey peers out the window into the fog. It's a nice night. I think we're all just stressed from studying. Are you fucking insane? Casey scoffs. She was about to go off, but then the waitress brought Tal and I's food. We ate quickly, and encouraged speaking to drown out the silence. After receiving our checks, I simply pointed to the door. There's no need to understand sign language for that. My message was clear, let's get the fuck out of here. We paid our bills and left in the same cars we came in. I looked at the clock. It read 2 a.m. I pointed to the clock and signed what? Tal noticed and said. There's no way we were in there for over two hours. Forty-five minutes, maximum. They looked quite freaked. I was trying to keep it together so we didn't crash on the way back. I noticed how empty the roads were, even the highway. Granted, it was 2 a.m. Once we got back, I found a parking lot near my friend's dorm, rather than my own. Tal and I exited my car, and I locked it as I watched everyone exited Casey's car. Casey stepped out, Emily came out of shotgun, and Emma from the back. I didn't see Joey. I approached Casey and signed. Where's Jay? What do you dash she turned to the empty backseat of her car. He was just there. We turned back to the direction of the dorm buildings to see a very tall silhouette walking inside. Joey. What the fuck? Casey exclaimed. We all realized nobody had his number, so we didn't even bother calling him. We'd see him later. Note since I'm writing this days later, he did in fact show back up in the dining hall the next evening. I searched the Ipe back up out of curiosity, remembering the street it was off of. I couldn't find it. My whole friend group still quite can't explain what happened. But now, we want more. This city and school has a reputation for weird shit. Time to see what else the cryptid crew can uncover. Stay tuned. LOL hope cryptid crew isn't too cheesy. Haven't proposed that name to them yet. Fifth story. Monsters do exist and seem to dwell in caves. It's Halloween season again, I hate this holiday, I used to like it, but now I hate it. I hate seeing all of these fake monsters roaming the streets, I hate people trying to be scary, and I hate anything that is trying to be scary as of late. I hate it so much because people do not know how lucky they are to be ignorant of what is like to look true fear in the eyes. Believe me or not, there are very real monsters out there, waiting for unsuspecting fools to enter their domain to be snatched away from the warm grasp of life. Now here's a story for you all bloodlusting heners, I've met two such monsters, or one, I'm not even sure if the woman was one. That other thing, now it was definitely a monster. It left Chris catatonic pretty much the moment he saw this thing. Chris is my twin brother, and we and the rest of our little gang, we did something stupid, most people would not consider that stupid, but I, I know better. Now it's just me and Chris, barely, the rest, they're gone. It was the stupidest thing we've ever decided to do. Cave 01 you see Chris, Tommy, Adam, Zarin and I, we were pretty much best friends since grade school. We were known collectively, there was never a situation where there was one of us without the others. For many years, we've been living by the beach. Now, not too far from our town, there's a cave system and until about a few months ago, none of us had ever gone inside. We've wanted to go there for a while, but could never muster the time to do so, eventually, during the last summer we planned our expedition into that cave system. Deep inside, we were all somewhat nerdy, to an extent, this is exactly why we were so adamant on checking out this piece of rocky soil. We've decided to prepare for this little trip of ours to avoid any troubles while we're there, hence every single one of us brought a backpack with a flashlight, some rope, and whatever other tools we deemed necessary. Like I've said, most people wouldn't find this a stupid poorly planned walk that had gone randomly wrong, we weren't a bunch of dumbass, or that's what we thought at least. 
We set out before sunrise and reached the spot just as the sun had began rising, it was Saturday morning, we exchanged greetings and started walking into the cave system. Flashlights went on about twenty seconds later, the space was dark and quiet. It was quiet for the most part, some water dripping sounds filled the various spaces inside, squeaking and clicking of bats was apparent too, and the sound of the ocean's waves beating across the shore behind us. There was nothing out the ordinary. We marched slowly deeper and deeper into the caves, adoring the almost mesmerizing shapes created by the various chamber openings inside the system, we saw a few bats, many cockroaches, and I think there was even some reptilian or something. I know you must be expecting some kind of creepy details to appear in my story, but I swear, there were none, not by that point, at least. Sometime after we had started going deep into the system, Adam flashed his light at one of the walls and found an opening. We walked towards it and began trying to see if there was anything beyond it and if we could pass through it. A few moments into our collective pondering, Zarin had decided to crawl into that space to see if there was anything to look for past this cavity, lo and behold, the cavity was a small space large enough for an adult to crawl through easily into another chamber. After letting us know it we could pass into that next chamber Zarin proceeded to push himself quickly into that chamber, once he hit the ground he yelled out, fuck, much to our surprise. We tried to shove our heads simultaneously into the opening in the wall to see if our friend had been warned, a second later he called out, watch out, guys, there's a turd or something here. We've calmed down immediately upon hearing him say that and laughed about it, then we made our way through the cavity as well, I went first, followed by Adam, and then by Chris, last to crawl in was Tommy. We had started scanning this new chamber with our flashlights, nothing but stone walls, nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing, until Chris Light hit someone's silhouette, the sight startled us all, there she stood before us, a person I can only describe as someone trying way too hard to look like a monster prostitute. With a frantic look in her blue eyes she began calling out in a shaking tone, his awaken, you've awaken him, run, we won't be able to protect you, run. As if getting surprised by a scantily clothed woman with a shit ton of Halloween-like makeup on her person wasn't creepy enough, her almost psychotic speech didn't even give us the chance to react, I tried to say something but she just screeched we said run, feigning to lunge at us like some maniac, honestly, that was enough to make us turn and begin climbing out of the chamber, it is when I started climbing out I had noticed that so-called turn Zarin stepped on earlier. It was a dog's corpse, knife stuck at the base of its neck, half decomposed, disgusting, the sight made my stomach turn and I've whispered to the others, don't step on the dog, this woman, whatever she was, kept on frantically speaking to herself, in third person, even after the most of us were out of the chamber. The look of shock in everyone's eyes must have meant that they heard me whispering, or at least were terrified by the woman. Couldn't blame them, still can't, I was kind of scared too at that moment. We didn't say a word and just started walking, towards the exist, we only had to walk straight, that much I remember, we didn't. To make our route out easier. All the way out, I kept hearing this broad saying things like, good boys, and leave, and listen to the hive. Yes, other than that everything was quiet in the cave system, no one spoke, and no sounds were produced by the caves. I guess the others might have heard her too. By this point, I've come to realize how deep into the caves we've ventured, because it took us more than fifteen minutes of walking and there was still no natural light in sight. Twenty minutes into our walk back out, I've grown tired of this woman's talking, I snapped my body backwards and yelled out, get the fuck away from me bitch. Much to my surprise, there was nothing behind me. The guys turned around to see what I was making a ruckus about, but before a reaction could be formed, I've seen a movement come from above, we all did, it came from the ceiling. Tommy's head fell of his body, it rolled on the floor, past the rest of the guys, and past me, by the time I managed to turn to him, his body was laying on the cave floor in the forming pool of his own blood. I remember feeling nothing, my vision getting sharper, Time grew painfully slow and my ears were flooded with the sound of my hasty heart rate beating against my rib cage. Slowly I turned around, he, it, this monster, I don't even know, a fucking seven plus foot scarecrow thing stood there with its back to us, its arm extended over Tommy's body, decorated with a blood-stained blade. A full body suit made of cloth covered his entire frame, the left side was orange and the right was green, it had a sack on as a mask, or a face, and a manner full of dark yellow hair, I guess. Various belts around its body and extremely pointy metallic-looking shoes. This monster turned its head at us, 
rotating it a hundred. Eighty degrees on its neck, two holes for eyes displayed two large, watery, faded grey-coloured eyes, and they seemed truly lifeless, as if devoid of a soul. With its head locked on us, this thing awkwardly back-flipped itself, keeping the head locked in place, if it were a human being, the neck would have been snapped, of this much I am sure. I didn't think, I didn't say anything, I just took a deep breath and ran, I ran as fast as I could, seems like this monster did not care. I had frozen in place once I heard the blood-curdling screams of my friends, tears streaming down my face, I was about to break down and cry but a scream of my brothers that came from behind me had knocked me into my senses. I remember turning around and seeing my brother running with a huge gash running down his right shoulder and down to his stomach with that bloody thing following him, legs first, it's like this thing was doing a crab walk or something, its body was arched backwards and it was almost running on all fours inverted. I took me a mill Isaacan to get running again and soon enough I saw the entrance to the cave, Chris and me almost made it out. Just a few more moments and we would have been out of the cave, out of the monster's home turf, we would have put it at a disadvantage because we had far more mobility on solid open ground that a gigantic cryptid that moves strangely on all fours. We got out. Not even a moment later, a pulsating, disgusting mass of dark reddish putrid smelled flesh grabbed a hold of Chris and began dragging him back inside, I grabbed at him too, and we both got yanked back into the cave system. I must have hit my head or something while we were struggling with that disgusting mash of an appendage because Chris was broken out of my hold, and everything began going blurry, the last clear thing I remember seeing was Chris' shadow kicking at something that looked like a centaur with a gigantic head and an extra horse head. I woke up some time later on the shore when the tide had pushed some seawater into my face. My head was throbbing with pain and the nausea hit me about a second later, Chris was sitting in a fetal possible by the entrance to the cave system. My state was so bad I had barely managed to get up to my feet and almost fell a few times during the attempt to walk towards my brother. Once I reached him, I could hear him mumbling over and over, skinless. I tried shaking him out of whatever state he was in, but his vacant stare would not change and he would not stop mumbling that word no matter how much I've tried. I fell down to my knees next to him, hugged him as tightly as I could and began crying and apologizing to him, blaming myself for what happened, even though it wasn't my fault, nor anyone's fault, we did not anticipate such a turn of events, we couldn't have. Amidst my crying, I heard the woman's voice coming out of the cave, still with that shaking tone, telling me, we couldn't save them, we couldn't save them, the hive is sorry. So, sorry, I snapped back at her and she just disappeared into the darkness of the cave. I did end up getting both of us home, Chris and I had gotten all the medical attention in the world and while my bad concussion was all healed up, Chris was never fixed, he is still stuck, unmoving, unresponsive, with that blank stare in his eyes, now they seem so lifeless, like his soul was taken away from him. From time to time he mutters something incoherent, I guess it's the word skinless or monster, you've no idea how scary it can be when he mutters something in the middle of the night. I tried telling people of what happened but no one believed me, they are pretty sure we've just gotten lost and fell through some opening in the cave floor, as the broken and mangled bodies of my dear friends were found deep inside the cave. Anyone whom I tried telling about this monster had disregarded it because of trauma-induced delusions. This is exactly the reason I've decided to share this here, I mean, the internet contains all sorts of informational oddities, maybe someone around the endless cyberspace will eventually believe me that monsters do exist and seem to dwell in.